it's week number seven that we've been in our study uh, concerning the 12 uh, chosen apostles of Christ. We found there in the book of Luke, uh, chapter number six, uh, where it says that, uh, he, he came, uh, Jesus came down off the mountain and called unto him, uh, twelve disciples in which he called apostles. And so, uh, every week we've been picking another, uh, disciple or apostle there and we've been studying their life and, uh, seeing what we can learn from them. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at the life of Simon Simon the Zealot. And uh, this is interesting. Uh, we're going to look in the Bible here real quick. We're going to read four verses and get on into the study tonight. And uh, if you want to, we can flip back and forth in the Gospels. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 10 and look in verse number 4 tonight. You can stay seated because we're going to flip back and forth here. And um, we'll get on into this study. Matthew chapter 10, verse number 4. We find this right here. It says, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, if you look over into the book of Mark, chapter number three, we'll find this. I'll give you a second to get there. I didn't mark these just so we'd probably get there about the same time. So Mark chapter number three, verse number 18 says this. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew... And Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Canaanite. Uh, so there we go again. What we're doing is we're reading the list of the names of the uh, 12 apostles here. Uh, of course, just centering in on Simon here. If you look in Luke chapter number 6, we'll flip over there. I'm going somewhere with this, so y'all just hang tight. Luke chapter number 6, verse number 15 Bible says this, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. All right, so there's verse number 15 of Luke 6. Now if you turn over to the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 1, Acts chapter number 1. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 13 says this, And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. So we've got four Bible verses right there, and we find the man Simon and all four of them. Well, that right there is all the Bible says about the Apostle Simon. So, I guess we can go home. <laughs> I'm joking. All right, some of y'all knew that. <laughs> there ain't a whole lot about him, is there? That ain't much to go on. Now, in the past couple weeks, we've, we've read not only that the list has the name of the Apostle in it, but... We've also found other passages in Scripture where uh, it would talk about a conversion experience or it would talk about uh, the moment that Jesus said, follow me, and a decision was made. and or, or we find out something about where they were from or what city they were in, but uh, uh, that's not the case with Simon. Literally, the only thing we have is his name. And it's listed in the Gospels, and then we find him in the upper room in the book of Acts. Now, Simon... He's said to be the most obscure of the disciples. As you've already seen, the only thing we know about him is literally his name. There are no comments in the Bible made by Simon, and there's no comments about Simon found in Scripture. And that's not all bad, though. There's a lesson in that. After all, it is better to have nothing or little said about us rather than having something bad said about us, right? Right? Uh, we know some of the other disciples had plenty of bad things said about them. Uh, but uh, I'd rather have, uh, no, hey, wh what's the old saying? Mama used to say, if you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing good. Don't say nothing at all, right? And so it's better not to have anything said than it is to have something bad. But I'm going to say this tonight. It says an awful lot about Simon 
that he was chosen by Jesus Christ himself as one of the twelve apostles. Don't you think? That's a great honor indeed, just to know that he was chosen by Jesus Christ. And I I hope y'all are getting where I'm going with this. He was chosen by Jesus Christ. And that's all we need to know about him to be able to know volumes about him. Uh, If y'all are getting where I'm going, if all that can be said about you tonight is that Jesus chose you and you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if that's all that can be said about you, honey, that's a plenty. You know what that means? That means you're not a loser. You're not a loser. That means that that you are following the true and living God of this universe and you are somebody. So it says a lot, doesn't it? It says plenty. It says plenty. Now, to study Simon Zelotes, you got to study his name. Because his name is all that we have. We don't have anything else to go on when it comes to Simon. So let's look at what we can conclude by looking at his name tonight. In Matthew and Mark, I've already read this, he's called Simon the Canaanite. In Luke and Acts, he's called Simon Zelotes. Now, the word Zelotes and Canaanite mean the same thing. Here's what they mean. They mean a, they describe a fiery spirit. They speak of an ardent zeal and a flaming unselfish devotion to a worthy cause. What about that? In this one word, we're able to discover a whole lot about this man. I want you to understand tonight that his name revealed some things about him. The first thing it revealed about him is his label. His name was a label. Uh, Let's look at the first one, Canaanite. In two of the Gospels, he was known as Simon the Canaanite. Well, in Simon the Canaanite, we have a symbolic connotation. What do I mean by that? Well, in Matthew and Mark, he's called the Simon, Simon the Canaanite. Now, when we first read that, we jump and and automatically conclude that it's talking about a geographical location, but it's not. It's not at all. It's an identifying term. I've already mentioned that. As Zelotes and Canaanite mean the same thing. The reason I can say that is because when you study the Greek word, Canaanios, which is what that Greek word is for Canaanite, its its meaning is to be jealous. It's not referring to a geographic location. We'll see that Simon in just a moment was one who was jealous for his country because the second label that he had is Zelotes. Now, Zelotes indicated a social condition. The Jews were being suppressed by the Roman government. We know that. We talked about that last week when we talked about Matthew, didn't we, with the taxing and everything. They were being suppressed by the Roman government. They were being overtaxed. They were being tortured. And men like Simon were devoted to overthrow this type of rule. This is where the name Zelotes came from, which brings us to the next point, point number two tonight. His name reveals not only his label, but it reveals his love. Watch this. He had a love for a cause. And we all, we understand this from his name. Uh, he had a love for a cause. The word of God records nothing of this man's life or his labors. We are not told anything that he said or anything that he did, but the name Zelotes is the only indication of any activity that he had. Now, Simon, because of that name, that one name, Zelotes, that tells us that he was a member of a fanatical Jewish party devoted to driving out the enemy from their country. They were known as the Zealots. And their history dates back to the time of the Maccabees in about 167 years before Christ. And the under the Maccabean family, the Jews rebelled against foreign rule and they were successful being led by a man named Judas Maccabeus. I'm probably not saying that right. 
And they felt, here's what it was, these guys felt that God was their only king and they would not give allegiance to anybody else. Period. And that tells us that Simon had a love also for his country. He had a love for his country. History, because history tells us that zealots were committed to die for their country. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not going to get into this very deep, but if you go to the Apocrypha, which is not part of the Bible, it's not inspired, the Catholic Church believes that it is, it's not. But some of you may understand that terminology, the Apocrypha. There are 14 extra books, and, and uh, there's been a debate throughout the years that it was part of the canon of Scripture. It's not the canon of Scripture. It's not inspired. It's not where we get doctrine. They're history. That's all that they are. And uh, there's two books in the Apocrypha, the Maccabees. That's where you find out about all this. You can read about the zealots and who they were and what they did. And, um, and you find out that they're freedom fighters. You find out that they, these men, they were willing to risk life and limb for their liberty. They were reckless. They were ruthless. They were radical. They were willing to run any risk at all to set their country free from the tyrannical rule of Rome. They didn't care what they had to do. They were not going to be under bondage by Rome or anybody for that matter. It was this party, the Zealots, which was responsible for the final overthrow of the Jews in AD 70 by the Titus, by Titus the Roman, in which 960 people died by their own hands. You see, the Zealots would die before going in bondage. I'm laying a foundation. I'm building a case for who Simon was here, and I'm going somewhere with it. So y'all just hang on. I told you in this series, series we would be talking about history. Now, I don't know about y'all. I love history. But that's who these people were. And that's who Simon was a part of. And here's what this tells us, okay? This tells us tonight that Simon was a man who was always doing something. He was ceaselessly busy in his attempts for freedom. He was not content to accept things the way that they were. As long as anything could be done, he was going to try it. Even if nothing could be done, he was not satisfied with the circumstances. As long as there was life in his body, he would never give up. Death was the only thing going to stop him, and he would do all that he could as long as he could to be free. And a man like this would not have been content to sit around and do nothing. His selection by Christ did not stop his activity. I want you to understand that. It would only send it in a different direction. Instead of being loyal to his country or to his leader then, he would be loyal to Jesus. I'm going to get into that more in a minute. I believe Simon would have been just as busy in the cause of Christ as he was before in the cause of being a freedom fighter. The only clue to what he did in the ministry of Christ, however, is found in reference to the twelve sent out two by two. He served faithfully in the task assigned him, as did the others on that occasion. And he wasn't a quitter because in the book of Acts we find him in the upper room. He was still there. And everything else he did is known only to God. But just because we don't know what he did doesn't mean he didn't do anything, y'all. He wasn't the kind of man that would sit and do nothing. And it's much the same way today. I want you to understand that there's countless thousands of God's servants whose works are known only to God. Just because they don't put it all over Facebook doesn't mean that they're not doing something for God. Can I remind you that the book of Matthew, chapter number 6, says this, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. I might get in trouble right here, but I guarantee you there's some pastors and some churches that would not help anybody out if they can't put a stinking picture of themselves on Facebook doing it. And my friend, let me tell you, what God says about that is, hey, you got your reward, honey. 
It's just Bible. So don't get mad at me. But you ain't got to publicize everything that you do. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying just because somebody puts it on Facebook means that that's their motive. It's not. But I'm telling you, for some, I guarantee it is. We better watch out. We need to make sure that God always gets the glory. And you know what? I have found myself doing this before. Now maybe I'm the only one that does this. But if I'm ever in doubt, I just leave it alone. I've stopped before. I've had pictures before. And I've thought, now who's really going to get the glory for this? Am I doing it for me or am I doing it for God? Well, guess what? If nobody else ever knows about it, God's the only one that can get the glory out of it. So here's the thing. However you do that, whether you help people out and you plaster it all over for the world to see, and I'm not saying that just because you do that, you're wrong. Do not misinterpret that. I'm not saying that. Sometimes that's how we get the word out and get more help. You understand? But at the same time, there are people out there that they only want to glory for themselves. And if they can't get glory for it, they're not going to do it. But either way, whether you choose to make it known or whether you choose to keep it between you and God, Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says this, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So we ought to be zealous also. We ought to fit that description of a Zelotes when it comes to good works for Jesus Christ. Notice that word there. Zealous of good works. And notice I spent all that time describing to you what a zealot was. Romans chapter 12 verse 11 says this. It says that we should be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Fervent. Fervent. So the natural questions that come to mind are this right here. Are you busy in service in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you work as hard for Jesus as you do in your own business? Do you give as much to the work of the Lord as you spend on your pleasures? How zealous are you when it comes to the house of God? How busy are we in doing the work that God has given us to do? Do you do it with all your might? Or do you barely even try? Which brings us to number three. His name not only revealed his label, it not only revealed his love, but it also reveals his leader. You see, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we all know it. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now listen, we're not told of the... I already mentioned this in the introduction a little bit, but we're not told... Of, of the circumstances under which Simon received his call to be an apostle, but his place among the twelve speaks of the, the appointment to this position. The apostles did not seek the position. They were sought for the position. And Simon's selection for service speaks of a miraculous change in his attitude and in his activity. He His appointment as an apostle made it necessary... For him to separate from the zealots. See, he couldn't be zealous for God and zealous for whatever else he was zealous for before he met Jesus. They were freedom fighters, and that's a good thing. But nothing was to trump his work for Jesus Christ. Nothing was to trump his devotion for Jesus Christ. I don't want to get in trouble saying this, 
There's nothing wrong with being patriotic. I love my country. Amen? I love my Lord more. If it wasn't for my Lord, I wouldn't have a country. So which one comes first in my life? My Lord does. So when Simon answered the call to become a follower of Christ, he had to set no matter how good it may have been, no matter how worthy of a cause he had, he had to set that on the back burner and follow Christ with all of his zeal. Now, for him to leave something to which he had such a strong commitment demanded a radical transformation in his life. Hey, there's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 once again. However, I want you to understand this. His attributes remain the same. His fiery spirit, his unusual courage, his reckless abandonment were characteristics he would still possess. But now they were all put to a to work to a higher and a holier cause. And that's what we do today. That's what God calls us to do when we are saved. I'm telling you tonight that Simon's leader went from Judas, Mace I can't even say the name, Maccabeus, or however you would say that, to Jesus Christ. His leader went from dissatisfaction to dedication. His leader went from, uh, from party, political party, to prince. His, his leader went from being a, a militant to meekness. His, part, he, his leader went from fanaticism to fellowship. He went, his leader went from uh, patriotism to preacher. He became a zealot instead of for the country. He became a zealot for the cause of Jesus Christ. And at the first, Simon may have thought of Jesus as one who could help him realize his dreams for a free land. But later, he must have come to realize that Rome was not the real problem in the life of the Jews. Sin was the real problem. It's the same problem today. And Jesus was the solution today, just like it was back then. You see, they were not enslaved by Rome they were enslaved by sin, just like mankind is today. Everybody wants to sit around and think, oh, well, this is my problem. That's my problem. This is what we need. Now, here in America, it's all about, oh, well, we need to, we need to loosen up on these and we need to, we need to have tighter gun control and we need to, uh, uh, we need to, uh, allow women to have abortions without any questions. No, our problem is sin. We don't need not tight. I mean, Tighter gun control doesn't work. Chicago, Illinois proves that for everybody. The problem is sin. The world can't understand that. They've got to look to everything else because they don't understand that. But Simon here, I don't know how long it come, uh, how long it took him to come to the understanding, but I believe he finally understood it. And some people never do though. Some people sit in church, they never understand it. They fit that verse that says ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. I mentioned that a, a couple weeks ago. They never seem to understand that the basic problem in the world is slavery to sin. And that Jesus is the only hope for freedom. Jesus said in John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. If you want to be free, He is the only solution to make you free. There is no other freedom. There is no freedom other than Jesus Christ. There is no slavery so hard as sin, and there is no freedom apart from Jesus Christ. So in conclusion tonight, I've talked about this before. But I want to make this point again because it keeps coming up in this Scripture or in the lives of the apostles here. With Simon, we see yet another astonishing thing when it comes to opposites or mixed personalities among the chosen twelve. They come from different backgrounds and their thoughts were contrary to each other. 
Yet in the presence of Jesus Christ, these men were in agreement with each other. In this complex company, there was conformity. Discord became accord by the powerful personality of Jesus Christ. Last week, we studied Matthew, didn't we? We talked about how he was the tax collector. We talked about all the, uh, the hatred that people would have had for him. We even went as far, we talked about how, how more than likely he probably would have took advantage of Peter, James, and John as far as taking money from them and excess taxes. And yet there they are. Jesus walks in and introduces him. Oh, hey, here's the man that probably stole your money. I'm sure that was a strange introduction is the way I put that last week. But I want you to understand this. Even further than that, we find Simon the Zealot here. Simon was the zealot. Matthew was the tax collector. Here's what I want you to understand. One man held out for his country while the other man sold out his country. Y'all getting where I'm going? One was a tax collector. Simon was a tax hater. One worked against Rome. The other worked with Rome. Now as a zealot, Simon would have taken every opportunity he had to kill Matthew. That's what they did. They were freedom fighters slash militia. If they saw a Roman guard and they were walking around and the Roman guard didn't have their guard up, they'd run behind them and stab them and then run off. That was their goal in life. Kill the Romans. Stand up for freedom. That's who the zealots were. I find that interesting. Under different circumstances, Simon would have hated Matthew. He would have done all he could to have killed him. Yet, we find both of them, both of them apostles, both of them sitting down together, eating, talking, in agreements, how? They even came to love one another. How? How? Because of Jesus. They both love Jesus. Jesus. When two people love Jesus tonight, it's not hard to love each other. It's not. Jesus came into the world to reconcile men to God. And when men are reconciled to God, guess what, honey? They're reconciled to each other. These men who were so radically different could come to agreement, then my friend, it's possible for all of us to do it. Which is why I got to ask this. Are you in agreement with your brother or sister in the Lord? Are you doing all you can, as the Bible says, to live peaceably with all men? Jesus said in His Word, that the world would recognize us as His followers by our love for one another. We've lost sight of that a lot. Some have, not everybody. Not everybody has. There's still some that love I saw today Brother Paul Chapel. I thank the world of him. Pastor's Lancaster Baptist Church out in California. He posted a picture of himself on Facebook standing next to uh, John MacArthur. I like John MacArthur. Sacrifice me if you want to. I read after him a lot. I think he'll be in heaven one day even though we don't see eye to eye on everything. Even though we don't read the same Bible. And Brother Paul had put a picture up, had his arm around him and said it was good to be able to meet, talk, and pray with John MacArthur this morning. Because see, John MacArthur's in a big battle with the county of Los Angeles over whether to have church. And the man's standing up for his religious freedom and the county's trying to arrest him. They're trying to do everything they can 
to keep the church shut down. And my friends, Brother Paul Chapel, now he believes. As far as I know, I, I read a lot of him. I, I love him. I, I read a, a lot of his stuff. And, and he's more right in line with the way that I believe, doctrinally and everything. And it didn't take but about five minutes for people to start roasting Paul Chapel like crazy because he put up a picture of him with John MacArthur. One fella even told him he was going to hell with John MacArthur. And the only thing I could think of is Jesus says that the world will recognize us as his followers by our love for one another. How are we going to love the world if we can't even love ourselves and love each other? It's sad to see so-called Christians have no more love than what they do. Perhaps they need to be saved. I don't know. It's between them and the Lord. I hope you love the brethren. We should. We might not all see eye to eye, but that's no reason to hate each other. I think I'm going to close with that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> here's my questions here's my questions let's all stand to our feet bow our heads close our eyes